The Major League Baseball draft is coming up in uh, about two weeks, July 11th through the 13th, being held in Denver in conjunction with uh, the All-Star Game around Coors Field. And uh, Kylie McDaniel joining us right now. He is draft expert number one at ESPN, uh, former employee at the four teams in the front office in Major League Baseball, guy that really knows his stuff and has joined us a few times. Kylie, when we talked a year ago, draft was the only thing happening in baseball nobody was playing no majors no minors no college i don't think there was any youth baseball going on at that time so the only thing you could talk about was the draft it's a lot nicer to have the games this year isn't it yeah i'm actually uh, because they moved the draft back this year there's like the typical beginning of the sort of summer showcase season for high school and college guys for next year's draft typically started right after the draft happened but a lot of those things stayed on the same date. So I'm trying to balance getting ready for the draft in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to go out and see some high school guys tomorrow uh, that are playing around my house in Atlanta, getting ready for guys a year from now, uh, which is actually going to be a dramatically better draft. So I'm excited to go see those guys. But it's, it's kind of difficult for a month there having to juggle both of them. But to your point, it's better to do both than to do nothing. You sound like the college baseball head coaches right now, Kylie, sort of lamenting the... The, the, the spot that uh, that Major League Baseball placed the draft this year because it's put them in a position where they're not really not sure in, 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 a, in, a, in a job in an industry where you're really never quite sure who's going to show up in your incoming class because of the draft this year, maybe maybe more so than, than ever before. Yeah, it reminds me of that joke in college football when uh, they interviewed Dabo Sweeney and Nick Saban from the national championship game. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's all great. We might win the whole thing, but like, I lost three weeks of recruiting. I'm going to be behind. <laughs> It's exactly right. That is exactly the way that they're looking at it. So I also ask you, like last year, you had a five round draft. So it was I don't remember the the um, the percentage, but it, was, it must have been I think it was near a hundred percent of the players that were drafted signed a contract because you're no one's going to risk a draft choice anymore when there used to be forty and then they had only five. There's twenty rounds right now. I don't know if that's the the number of rounds you'll have in the foreseeable future, but is it also the thought that? You know, if somebody gets drafted out of high school, then they're going to sign the contract. Uh, in the top 10 rounds, yes. In this most recent iteration of the CBA and the sort of draft rules, uh, the way it's set up is you have a draft pool for your first 10 picks. And if you don't sign the guy, you lose that pool. And teams are sort of lining up everybody to be like, like I can tell you from sitting in draft rooms, like when we were at the Braves the last couple drafts, it was like we're going to spend all of our money in the first four or five picks, and then we're going to uh, have the minimum allowable bonus, $1,000, for our last couple picks in the ninth and tenth rounds. Like, it was calculated to within a dollar. And so you can't do that. If you're like, ah, if the sixth rounder doesn't sign, we lose, you know, $300,000 of pool money, and uh, ah, we'll figure it out. Like, that's not the way it works when you have a, a hard slotting like this. So, yeah, there's always going to be a couple guys that, like, fail a physical or they end up changing their mind or whatever. But it's, like, you know, no more than five or six guys usually in the top ten rounds. Like, if they go, they're almost certainly signing. And they all and they definitely have a number agreed to whether one of them reneges on it or not. Yeah, Kyle, it's always um, hard for college coaches to really figure out what they've got now, especially that it's bounced back. And uh, you've got, I think, I believe, five uh, ar- incoming uh, Arkansas freshmen. Uh, and basically, from what you said, if, Dave Van Horn and Razorback fans probably shouldn't uh, really expect them to be making their way to Fayetteville anytime soon. But uh, out of the guys that Arkansas had originally signed, who do you think has the best um, MLB potential? Ooh, now now, you caught me off guard here. I don't have the list. Oh, I'm sorry. I think the highest one you have uh, ranked is uh, Max Muncy, the uh, shortstop out of of California. Is he he probably the highest grade? Yeah, I think he now, the, the sort of buzz is growing on him. Uh, like you said, high school shortstop out of Southern California. He's at Thousand Oaks, which is, I think, won the national championship out of high schools. Um, he is, he seems now likely to go on the first day, which is the first 36 picks. There's a, there's sort of a glut from about 20 to 40, maybe 50 overall of a bunch of high school hitters that are hard to sort out. And it sounds like he is sort of graded out well enough that there's a lot of spots that he could land in the 20s, and I would imagine he'll be off the board by 36. And if he somehow makes it to day two, I would imagine uh, he'll end up going in a spot where he's going to sign. Mm-hmm. And, and as far as current Razorback players, uh, Christian Franklin, I think he's the highest guy that you've got uh, ranked. But what about the guy who's set to win the Golden Spikes Award and has, had, has basically had his trophy case filled in the last few weeks in Kevin Copps? Uh, where do you see him fall, uh, getting picked up at? Yeah, he's an interesting one because he is at the least 23 and obviously is not, you know, bumping 99. And as a college reliever, not that last start notwithstanding, it's 
sort of puts him in a group of players where you just each of those specific demographics push you down a little further down the board. But he's also one of those guys where if a team is looking to save some money at a pick early where you get to sort of, you know, there's like a constellation of all the different kinds of seniors or or older high school juniors. Obviously, there's a lot of 22-year-old COVID juniors where they're going to sign for a lower bonus. If a team is saving money for a high school guy later, they got to save money on an early pick. They're going to go after a 22, 23-year-old college guy, hopefully one that can move quickly, maybe get into the big leagues in you know a year or two. He could be at the top of that list. I think on pure talent, he's the fourth to sixth rounder for those reasons. Like pure relievers typically don't go much higher than that um, unless they're throwing 100 and throwing strikes, which is you know pretty rare these days. Um, but I can see him going as high as the third round if somebody, you know, if a team just needs to get a cost savings because they've moved a high school guy down the board and they just want to sort of get first pick at the guy that could move quickly through the system. Kylie, so much has been written, and, and now we're focusing on them, too, because their team's in the College World Series finals on, on uh, Jack Leiter and Kamar Rocker, and rightfully so. It felt for a long time that it was a foregone conclusion that Pittsburgh would take either one of them as the number one overall pick. But it's been a couple of months since that thought was prevailing. Is that a matter of them slipping or these two uh, high school shortstops that you've written about, Marcelo Meyer and Jordan Lawler, are the best available players? Or is it really a matter of like what the Pirates need over what's available as the top overall pick? Yeah, this year is a unique draft relative to, I would say, other sports and also the last few years of the baseball draft, which is we've had, whether it's been Spencer Torkelson out of Arizona State going to the Tigers, Adley Rutschman out of Oregon State going to Baltimore, Casey Mize out of Auburn going to Detroit. It was pretty clear a couple months in advance this guy's very likely to go first, and then about a month to three weeks out, it was like, oh, this is like 90% chance, or, you know, it became very likely at some point who was going to go first. And then, you know, even the year Bobby Wood Jr. went second, it was pretty understood he would probably go second. And you see this with the baseball and football drafts where, you know, the first couple picks get sort of telegraphed a couple, a couple of weeks out at least, if not more. And that's typically how it works with baseball. Now, this year is unique because there is a top tier of, depending on who you ask, six to eight players, none of them are seen as clearly better than the other. And all of them are, like, reasonable candidates at the first pick. Maybe five out of the eight are, like, consensus. You could, you know, contort yourself to say this guy's the best guy. And so in the sort of format of the draft we have where you can't trade picks and every bonus is negotiable, whereas in the other two drafts you can trade picks and it's not negotiable. So baseball sort of unique in that setup. Uh, it basically comes down to what the price is because, I mean, even just me, if I'm picking, there's four or five guys you could talk me into if one of them is a million dollars cheaper than the other ones because then that's a million dollars you can spend that your rivals don't have at a later pick. And nobody has set their prices yet because I've talked to the advisors for all the top players and who've spoken to the families, the scouts and executives involved on the team side. None of these conversations have happened yet. Nobody set a price. A couple of the players you've mentioned, I, I've talked to the family. They're like, yeah, we haven't decided what our number is yet. So it's like nobody knows what anybody's demands are or if we're going to have a Carlos Correa situation where if he doesn't go first, he's going to fall to sixth overall, so he'll take a big haircut to go first. That's the kind of thing that I think will happen at the first pick, and we don't know what the prices are. So it's a lot of sort of guessing at this point with mock drafts and sort of momentum, and is it Meyer, is it Lawler, who are the dark horse options? Like you have to have things figured out enough to know what your spots are, and we might still be at least a week away from that, and it could be day of the draft stuff. So it's exciting to me that while there's not that generational talent that everybody can do backflips over that might be an all-timer, I think we're going to get to draft day and not know who's going first, second, third, fourth, any of those picks, which usually doesn't happen. A little more intrigued. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, I wonder, you know, the big controversy across not just Major League Baseball, but Pro Ball overall right now, of course, is the sticky stuff that's been banned, and it's affected it's affected pitchers in a lot of ways. Some of them say, I've had to, I've had to learn how to pitch again. You know, I don't know if you saw Garrett Richards yesterday. He basically was inventing pitches on the fly. Uh, I, now, now, and I saw, I don't know if it's a report or a column in Baseball America, some scouts think that a lot of college pitchers have been able to put some substances on the ball. I wonder if, there's if you've detected from your conversations with front offices that there they might be a little gun shy about drafting certain pitchers with the knowledge that they won't be able to put any substances on the ball or is that over is that looking too deep into this i don't think that's going to change anybody's decision but i will say that it is i mean this is how it happens in baseball with whether it was steroids or you know sticky stuff or any number of things where it existed. Nobody did anything. Nobody said anything. It was not a topic anyone talked about. 
And then because it wasn't getting enforced, it spun out of control. And then baseball came in with a little too heavy of a hand, a little too late, and sort of mangled it. Like, this feels familiar to baseball. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's going to be a bit of, a, 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 of an adjustment. And obviously, uh, you know, similar to steroids, like there was a period in college baseball people don't like to talk about where, like, some dudes gained 30 pounds of muscle, hit a ton of home runs, and teams were like, eh, I don't know if I'm going to trust this. And everyone just assumed everyone knew what we were talking about. And that doesn't really exist now. So, luckily, that got drummed out as well. And I would also say there's a couple of college programs. I mean, Vanderbilt and Arkansas are probably the foremost that are really good at optimizing their pitchers, which, you know, in terms of, like, their deliveries and strike throwing and the shape of their stuff and also spin rates. So I would in general say like the bigger programs that are really good at stuff are probably more likely to be doing that. But it's also like all right, this guy's curveball 2,800 RPMs. You draft him, it's 2,650. I'm, I'm not sure you're not drafting him because of that. And I don't think anybody knows for sure. I haven't heard anything. I, I feel like if there were some very egregious violators, I would have heard about it by now. There's not a team or a specific player anybody's talking about. So while I wouldn't say that's overblown in terms of people aren't doing it, I don't think it's going to change where guys are drafted. Hopefully it doesn't, and I just think you're exactly right. It just this is so baseball. I mean, and everybody who's followed baseball their entire life knows exactly what that means of them just constantly screwing things up and overcorrecting and just messing with the game itself. But Kylie, we're sitting here in in Arkansas, which is mostly Cardinals country, and for a lot of our listeners, they our diehard cards fans. Is there anybody on the Cardinals draft board that you think uh, fans should be looking for in the future as somebody that can help that team? Definitely. I mean, obviously not going to be this year, but in years to come. You mean in terms of the draft or in the minor leagues? In the draft. That, 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 yeah, that they have tough, eyed. Yeah, they're in, a, they're in a tough spot because this top, top tier of the draft, like I said, is at six to eight guys, and there's some teams picking right behind them where that next tier is mostly agreed upon another you know, six to eight or so. And then once you get beyond about 15 or so, you're in that third tier. And it's like you could argue for 50 different guys being in that tier. And I think that's where the Cardinals are going to be. And I've heard some, you know, some sort of chatter about guys they're interested in. I would imagine it will be a college pitcher from that in that second to third tier area. There's a lot of them. There's Gunnar Hoglund from Ole Miss coming off of Tommy John. Will Bednar, we just saw Mississippi State in the College World Series. Uh, Ty Madden at Texas, uh, Jordan Wicks at Kansas State. There's like five or six guys right in that area. If I had to guess what they end up with, it's probably one of those guys, and they'll probably be you know a quicker mover, chance to impact the team within about two years. Mm. Uh, you can give me a yes or no on this, and and then and then I'll have my last question for you, and we can let you go, Kylie. Uh, the incoming freshman uh, reported to campus a few days ago here at Arkansas, and I think in other spots too. Uh, is it safe to say that if these freshmen have reported to campus? then we're not going to hear their names on draft day one, two, or three? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so okay. so I, I have actually clarified with Major League Baseball, because I know this happened in the past, but it became more of a conversation point this year, uh, more than in the past. I'm not really sure why. Uh, Will Taylor is a huge uh, Clemson dual sport commit uh, that Dabo Sweeney has already come out and said will play like option quarterback and slot receiver and is a mid-first-round baseball uh, prospect. And uh, Major League Baseball clarified to me and has had to clarify to teams this week that uh, summer classes mean nothing. They don't lose their eligibility until fall classes. And it may indicate either, A, they think they're not going to sign or there's not the right level of interest for them to turn pro, or they just want to play hardball in negotiations. And uh, since we've been talking, I pulled up the list of commits. You mentioned Max Muncy, who I think is the most likely guy to turn pro. Peyton Stovall, high school, probably second baseman in pro ball out of Louisiana. I would say is the the other guy that is likely to go in those top 50 to 60 picks. And if he goes there, then he probably turns pro pretty much everybody else. And there's some interesting guys on there that I think could be, you know, interesting talent as a freshman. They're all less than 50% chance to sign. So those are the two guys to keep an eye on. Uh, so I would say if any of those other guys have early enrolled, I would say they're probably coming to school, but not related to them early enrolling. Great stuff, Kylie. Appreciate you hopping on with us. I know you're super busy these days. Uh, Good luck with uh, everything coming up to the draft, and we'll definitely be reading you on ESPN. Thanks, yeah. It's actually been busy, but I've been at home, so I've been able to smoke (laughs) some meat. i got some carnitas to get through now. Good. (laughs) Good. Good. Well, it's good talking to you. And and keep the quotes coming from Nick Saban, because he's always right about that stuff. Kyler McDaniel for you guys would love that. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, exactly. We're tired of hearing <laughs> Saban all the time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, the names like Braylon Bishop, Hagen Smith, Drake Varnado, uh, Max Solis, Kendall Diggs. Uh, these might be players, according to Kyler McDaniel, that not are not just going to make it to campus, but will probably be playing for this for this Arkansas baseball program. It's not gospel when Kylie says it. 
Uh, but the dude definitely knows what he's talking about. 877-377-6963. We are hoping for your votes. What's your favorite ESPN Arkansas show? It's got to be halftime. If not, it has to be. There's other shows. We'll be right back.